Let's pray together. Holy, merciful Father, who loves us, we were far from you in sins. We followed our fleshly desires. We were deserving of your wrath um, and your punishment, but Lord, you had pity on us, compassion on us, and with your great love, Lord, you have saved us, allowing us to um, be free from our sins through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through his precious blood, Lord, we have been saved, we've been cleansed, and Lord, we now don't need to receive any punishment or chastisement, chastisement Lord, and we thank you for giving us this amazing grace. You have allowed us to become your children, and you have allowed us to, um, you, have been, you have given us this um, great uh, heavenly hope, and we thank you for that as well. Um, now for the remainder of our lives in our flesh, Lord, we ask that you can allow us to live for your will and for your glory, Lord. We ask that you can work um, through us and really control our lives, Lord. Allow us not to seek the things of this world anymore, the vain things of this world, and allow us not to follow after the fleshly lust, but allow our thoughts and our minds to be held on to by um, your um, your power, Lord. We pray for the churches domestically and the churches all over the world. We're uh, pleased to be with them, Lord, and be with each and every one of the sisters as well. Um, please do give us the appropriate amount of grace. Lord, you take care of our weaknesses. We ask that through your grace and your righteous hands, you can uphold us and please allow us to become more and more complete in front of you so that we can live more and more appropriately as your children. With this great love and grace that you have given to us, Lord, um, allow us to preach this, this, this grace and love that you have given to us to the people that are not saved so that your work can be done and so that they can receive salvation. Please do pour upon us your wisdom, your words, your love. And allow us to be filled with these things so that we can really discern your words correctly and so that we can apply your words in our lives as well. We pray for the brothers and sisters that are um, sick. Please do heal them and allow us to um, all live the remainder of our lives for you, Lord. Please do give us these many opportunities. We ask that you reveal your holy will and your words to us at this hour. Allow us to know exactly how we ought to live our lives. Um, we ask that you can yourself teach us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you very much. Let's open up our Bibles. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. The New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4. From verse 1 to verse 6. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who was above all and through all and in you all. That was Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. Just read up to there. The cold winter has now passed and we feel the warmth of spring. The leaves that seem dead um, are starting to, well, the trees, the branches are starting to bud and we can see um, beautiful leaves all around. Seems like all the creation is reviving to the spring weather. In this world, There are summer-like days, and there are also winter-like days. Um, there are many uh, persecutions, tribulations, sufferings in our lives. Um, and when those harsh winter-like um, suffering times pass, we are faced with a very beautiful, glor um, glorious day. And, and those are the days that we really hope for um, in the future as well. Because heaven, um, there is no summer. There is no cold winter days. It's very beautiful. And we will be living in the light of God's love eternally. And we will be with God always. The time that we have... Um, the quicker it passes, the closer we get to the um, day that we meet, that we will see God. And we know that the days of suffering in this world will soon end and we will eventually enter into the kingdom of God. Um, we believe in that and we are thankful, we, are, uh, we endure and, and, and are patient. Um, throughout the entire country and throughout all the... Um, the world, the churches that we have, the, the gospel is being preached. And every single day, people are receiving salvation. We hear good news like this um, very, very frequently. It's something that we're so very thankful for. And it is proof, yes, that God is working through us. So now we who are saved Christians... We have to know exactly how we need to live. As children of God that have received salvation, we shouldn't live like we previously did, seeking those things that are vain and useless of this world. We should not be living according to our fleshly desires. No, rather, whether we die or whether we live, we live for the Lord and His will and His glory. Those are the things that we ought to live for. We know that the Lord, He is with us and He will help us live in this way. The life of the born-again Christian is not a vague type of um, life either. The Holy Spirit is with us and it helps us live our faith lives on a daily basis. It changes us on a daily basis and allows us to live more and more um, acceptably as a child of God. 
so that we can soon be those that will enter the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit helps us in this manner. Before we were saved, we sought after the wicked things um, and we were deserving of hell. But after receiving salvation, we now live as children of God and we have received the right to be the children of God. We have the right to enter into heaven and he helps us live those appropriate lives. So those, um, whether you have been saved for uh, a, a little while or a very long time, um, there are um, some people who have been saved in general that live for their own selves, right? For their own flesh. They don't really rely on the invisible strength of God. They don't follow his guidance and live for his will. Rather, what they do is that they seek after the things that they can see, the present things, and those things um, in, I mean, capture them and they live in this, um, in this way. And this is a very big contradiction for a Christian and it is a very big sin in front of God. And so that is why we saved Christians. We need to think about how we need to live. It's a very important topic to think about. And there are a lot of teachings in the scriptures that talk about this topic as well. We gather together, we learn the word of God together. And the reason why we do so is to understand the will of God and to, to understand what the guidance of the Holy Spirit is as well. And it is or, in order for us to live a proper Christian life. So that is why we are continually learning about how to live appropriately um, as Christians. Specifically, the title for the, the sermon today, as previous weeks, is The Life Abiding Within the Lord. And we want to really think about exactly what that means. And that is what we're going to talk about today. In the passage that we just read, of course, Ephesians, this book, um, was written to a Gentile church. There are Christians that were saved in this um, in this region, and this is given to it was given to them. It was likewise, it is likewise rather given to us today as well. If we go to chapter four, verse one, it says, "I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called." Apostle Paul, when he wrote this epistle, he was in Rome. He was preaching the gospel in Rome um, as well. The Jewish people, they tried to kill him. And even though uh, Apostle Paul, he was a Jew, he had the citizenship of um, Rome and he appealed to Caesar. He said he wanted to be judged by Caesar himself, but that wasn't the purpose of his ministry. Um, the Lord, he wanted Apostle Paul um, to preach the gospel because he wasn't going to die in jail. Many people tried to kill him, sure, because there, there, there are many people that tried to kill him so much so that they, you know, they didn't want, they, um, you know, even starved themselves, right, in, in order to kill him, right? They wanted to see him dead before they would eat their next meal. And so let's imagine this. Apostle Paul, there are many times he was um, on the brink of death. He was imprisoned frequently. He was beaten in stripes above measure. And three times he was beaten with rods. Um, and he was, um, uh, he, was, he was beaten once again in, in very much um, many different ways. And he received many sufferings and tribulations. But above all these things, God, he protected him. And he said, you will not die. The place that you will die is a separate place in Rome. And so you will have to witness on me there, right? <clears throat> and so he did, in the end, go to Rome and he preached the gospel there. And when the, the work of the gospel was clearly seen, <clears throat> there was a saying in the past that said, all roads lead to Rome. And he was would be able to preach, and the gospel would be able to be preached into the entire world if he was able to preach the gospel in Rome, which is the exact reason why Apostle Paul, he went there. And, and, and the Lord, he was the one who led him there. Apostle Paul, he really desired to preach the gospel in Rome. So he did go to Rome, and for two years, he was in prison um, in, in his home, his house of rest, and he preached the gospel there. While he was there, he... I mean, prison specifically, he wrote the book of Ephesians and he sent, sent this letter to the church of Ephesus. 
And so here he says once again, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. Um, and I think we need to think about this in his perspective. Let's take a step back into time. We, um, the saved Christians, um, the, 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 the Christian at the time, they didn't know when Apostle Paul, he would die. He was imprisoned. And this was a letter that was sent to them, the, the Church of Ephesus, um, at that time. And this is an um, a, um, admonition to them. This was like a will-like letter. And to Christians, we, they were able to feel the love and his great desire um, to really teach them the right way. It says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The fact that we have received this calling, um, we know that God, he has called all sinners. If you look at Psalm chapter 50, verse 1, it says, The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. The gospel had started in Jerusalem and it went to the ends of the earth. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, likewise, it says, And this gospel, the kingdom, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. This was preached to all the worlds, right? Um, this, this message was a message that called sinners back to Jesus Christ, to God. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22 as well. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins Return to me, for I have redeemed you. He says, I have, I have, uh, I have uh, redeemed you already, so come back to me. Right? Uh, this is the voice of God. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 22, it says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. Right? All you ends of the earth, he says. All the people of the ends of the earth. If you look to me, then you will be saved. You see, God, he is calling each and every one of us. And when you receive salvation, you answer that calling. You respond to that call. I'm sorry, that was Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. He calls us and we answer that call. And when we do answer that call, that is when we receive salvation. So once again, it says here, the walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So that is us, we who have received um, on this calling or answered this calling, right? And we need to walk worthy of the calling. He has called us. And there's a reason why he has called us. There's a reason why he saved us. And we have to walk worthy of that purpose, right? And that is what Apostle Paul here is saying. Our calling it says, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. And just like that, he has saved us so that our thoughts, our minds can change um, in a holier way on a daily basis. And so that we could become more like Christ. So that we can enter, we can be ready and pre be prepared to enter into that eternal glory. God, he has left us in this world to accomplish these purposes. And so, yes, once again, he says to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. This is a command that the Lord, he has given to us. As born-again Christians, we are his children, God's children, and we need to live acceptably as his children. But the question becomes, how can I live appropriately or acceptably? Do I just go to church back and forth, in and out? No, that's not the case. It's not just that. The Lord, um, his words, his will, we have to understand it. And then we have to apply it, right? That um, is someone that we have to become, right? We have to become those that really apply the words of God, the will of God in our lives. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Here, is that you may walk worthy of the Lord. The Christian, as a child of God, must now live 
and walk worthy of the Lord. This is something that is very, very natural and obvious. It says fully pleasing Him. He who we have to please Him who saved us. The Lord Himself. He says He always did the things that please His Father. Um, in John eight twenty nine says the Father has not left me alone for I always do those things that please Him. Right, but when when He made the determination to die on the cross, at that time, um, God He said, "This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased." When He was baptized, the same voice, the same um, um, words came out. Even Matthew chapter seventeen in the mountain of transfiguration, He met Elijah and Moses, and they were discussing about Him dying on the cross. Right. Um, and not not this, much of a discussion. We know that Moses and Elijah they were the representatives of the Old Testament, and they, you know, are they were talking with Jesus Christ at the time, and they were talking to him about how he would die on the cross. And at that time as well, there was a voice that appeared from heaven, and the voice said, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was he pleased God to the extent of even dying on the cross, because that's what pleased his Father. And so now we who are saved, we ought to likewise um, live for him, right? Jesus, he was um, crucified. He died. To, he, he died, and that's how much he loved us, right? Naturally, for us as well, we ought to please God. That is what is natural. In order to, we, we do our best to please our parents who gave birth to us, right? And who raised us, right? Because they gave us many of these graces. Likewise, we too must do this to our Heavenly Father. Psalm chapter 1, 16, verse 12, it says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? In other words, we must please God. And so, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Fully pleasing him. Right? We must please him in everything that we do. We must glorify God's name in all that we do. It says bring, being fruitful in every good work. Right? So all of the works or the works that we do now must be um, fruitful, right? And good. A farmer that plants a seed will um, water it and, and raise it well. And the reason why is for it to bear a lot of good fruit. Jesus, he is the 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 the, the vine, the true vine, and we are the branches. And if as long as we are on this vine, then yes, we will bear many fruits. And when we bear much fruit, we glorify God's name. So in our lives, we must bear fruit. We must live according to his life, or his, his will rather, and that is um that is what it means to bear fruit. And we learn about the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, and that's not over yet that series by the way, but um, we have to bear those fruits as well. And saving lost souls and bringing them back to the Lord, when God, he sees that those become beautiful fruits in his sight as well. So we must be fruitful in every good work. If a tr there's a tree and there are no fruits on that tree, or perhaps it did bear fruit, but it becomes rotten or... Um, um, if it becomes rotten, then it's not very, it's not edible, right? And it does not glorify the farmer who is raising this, this, this tree. And so likewise, we must please the Lord in everything that we do. Once again, being fruitful in every good work. And it says, lastly, in Colossians 1.10, and increasing in the knowledge of God, right? Knowing God, this means to understand the love of God, understand the grace of God. And then afterwards, we must know more about God. There's so many things that we need to know more about God. And um, we only know a very small portion about God. Apostle Paul, he said this, right? We know that we only know a portion, right? Only a very small portion of God. If it's a blind person, if there's a blind person, he talks, he touches the legs of the, an elephant, then it becomes like a, if it's like a pillar. Um, if, if he talks to the stomach or the, the, the maybe the even the nose of the elephant, maybe it feels like a pipe or something like this. Um, and if it touches a portion, if a blind person touches a portion of an elephant, they don't really know what it is. 
But if the blind man was able to open his eyes and see the elephant, then he would be able to say, oh, this is what an elephant is, how it looks like. And it's very similar um, in terms of how we know about God. We only know a very small portion of God. Newton himself said, he, um, when he discovered all the, um, his, these, these laws of gravity, he said that what I know about God is like a, um, a kid finding a seashell in, in the great ocean, right? In the great sea on um, sea, on a beach on a, in a big sea, of course. And one thing that he didn't know, he know, he knew very small amount, a, a little bit about God, but he knew that God, he was someone that ruled over the entire world and created the entire universe. Um, he only knew that small portion of God. What God desires of us is for us to know more and more about him on a daily basis. Right? We must grow in the knowledge of God. We must increase in the knowledge of God. Right? As we grow, um, as we're born in this world and we grow, we learn more about, God, um, about life. Right? When we are first born, we learn about the love of our parents. And then we are protected by our par uh, family members. And, and in the midst of all this, we, know, we start to learn what we have to do and what role we have to play in, uh, in this family. Eventually, we go to school and we learn the education of the world. We become older and older. And we increase in knowledge. And just like that, we who are saved must increase in the knowledge of God, right? And what this means is to become more and more like God himself. We must become more and more like him. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must grow, right? We must grow in this knowledge, not only does our head just become bigger in, in terms of getting more knowledge, but our personality, our character must change as well. And when our character starts to change, our thoughts, actions, they start to change likewise. Some people, they just act any way they want to. And they live according to their own thoughts, their own stubbornness, and they just act any way that they want to. And if you look at those type of people... It doesn't matter how great of a school he went to, um, what, what great education he received, people look at that type of person and say, that person's ignorant, he is unsophisticated, right? And they say these things, even though this person might be um, very educated in the uh, worldly knowledge. Um, but the more we know as Christians about God, the more humble we become. And we learn what it means to be gentle, like Jesus was. We learn to become wise as well. That is what a true, um, true, uh, a knowledgeable person is, right? And so we need to be um, a, a true, uh, a true Christians in front of God. And when we um, learn more about the Bible, we can become um, a true person-like person, right? And so we must grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We become more and more like Him. First Peter chapter one. It says that through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature. We may become more and more like the Lord. Right? How is it that we can copy or go after um, this divine nature? We just learn more about the word of God. The Holy Spirit, it changes our corrupt nature and becomes, allows us to become more like Jesus Christ. And so that is the reason why he saved us. And let's also go to Philippians, which is right before Colossians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This book, um, as well, was a book that was written when Apostle Paul, he was in prison. And he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. We have received salvation through the gospel. And we must live and conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel of Christ. When we receive salvation, we hear the word of God and understand the grace of God. The gospel, it changes our lives. Furthermore, it helps us live appropriately as children. 
That's why in Philippians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. We receive salvation through the gospel, and we have fellowship in the gospel. We must live acceptably and worthy of the gospel. But this life, right, says, um, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that, right, and and in the in, in and so we have to we have to it, what it means to live um, um worthy of the gospel of Christ means this we need to live as citizens right appropriately appropriately as citizens citizens of what citizens of the kingdom of God and that's why in Philippians chapter three verse twenty it says for our citizenship is in heaven and so yes as Christians our flesh lives in this world but our but we have to understand that our citizenship is in heaven. Right? We are the children of God, and we are also citizens of heaven. Citizens of heaven. For our citizenship is in heaven. Um, those people that live in a poor nation, if they get a citizenship in a rich nation, it's a very glorious thing. In the past, you know, if you were a citizen of America, um, people are very proud. And there are many people that think about it that way um, even today, right? Because America is a very rich country, a very um, great country. But, of course, there's not just because you live in America doesn't mean everything is great. Of course, there are the uh, bad things as well. But anyways, you know, for me, there's not really a nation that I want to live in. Specific nation. You know, if you go to St Switzerland, you can see, um, you know, like many great, beautiful pictures of the, um, Switzerland, right? And it, it's very beautiful. And, you know, it, it may seem like a country that you want to live in if you look at those pictures. You know, you see the great, um, the green pastures, and you see like the, um, the calm um, scenery. But if you go there and live there, yes, it looks beautiful. But do you think it's a very good place to live? No, if you look at, if you ask the citizens there, it's a very tiring country to live in, perhaps. And, you know, they, you're not going to, they're not going to say good things about it all the time. Just because the scenery is nice doesn't mean it's a good place to live. They too have their difficulties in life, sufferings, pains in their lives as well. Um, everything might be beautiful, but I am becoming older. I'm getting sick and soon I don't know what beauty really is. The, the thing that we should be desiring the most, the country that we should be um, desiring the most, is uh, the kingdom of heaven. If you don't have that hope of the kingdom of heaven, then what purpose does our salvation serve? That's why in Romans chapter 8, verse 24 says, For we were saved in this hope. Right? We were saved in this hope. The God, He has saved us so that He can allow, so that we can be able to go to heaven, right? So He wants He wants to give us this um, heavenly inheritance to us, and that is why He has saved us. So that's why you know, if you have a citizenship in a great nation, you know, you naturally want to move to that country if you're not there already. You can go through the um that all those process, the immigration process, and everything is ready to go. And now we are ready to go to heaven. Our, our, the, the visa, we got our visas and the immigration um, process is all done. We don't need, we need to buy a plane ticket. We could just go there when the time comes. Whether we die and we go to the Lord or whether we are alive and the Lord comes and we get raptured to heaven, that day is very, very near. And so that's why we are those that are eagerly waiting for him. We eagerly wait for the Lord to come back. Our lowly bodies will become glorious ones. He will change it and transform our bodies into this way. Our bodies will become very spiritual bodies in front of God. When we go there, we will go to heaven. And we know that there is no winter there. There is no summer there. Um, um, and there are no cursed things um, like there are in the world, in heaven, right? There are no tyrannical dictators, there are no swindlers. There are no sicknesses. There is nothing bad in heaven. And so heaven is such a beautiful place. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says um, that this is the place, right? It says, The eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. There's nothing that can compare to the beauty of heaven in this world, right? Because it is such a, it is, it is the eternal place where God is. So yes, we have the citizenship um, to enter into that place. And we desire to go there. We yearn for that place. Do you want to live here longer? Doctors, um, you know, when they diagnose a sickness or your condition, and they say, oh, you have only two years left. Uh, you only have a year left or two months left to live. Then when you get the diagnosis, it does the Though the sky feel like it's crumbling down? Do you fall in despair? If you're a true safe Christian, then you'll say, oh, yes, that day to enter heaven gets is, is getting closer. Right? It's better to live in heaven um, one month longer than living here on this earth one month longer, right? It is so much greater. People are so afraid of death. And they feel so uncertain and they think it's, uh, they, they fall into despair when they think about death. But for Christians, that's not the case. That is a day that our sufferings will end and we will be able to see the Lord who saved us, right? We will be able to be with our four, the forefathers of faith. Right? That is a day that we will meet all of them. And we yearn for that day. And while we live in this world, we must live appropriately as those that are going to go to heaven. As those that are, are, are citizens of heaven, we must change our heart, attitude, lives in front of God, and we must become more and more like Christ. Furthermore, Christians, born again people, are I mean, we're going to live with each other in heaven eternally. And that is why we must not hate each other, fight with each other, contend with each other, um, be jealous of one another. Um, that's not right. Because soon, we will stand in front of God and all of those things will disappear. God's love and his glory will be filled in heaven. We'll be living with each other eternally. So why is it that we're disputing and hating each other over small things? That's not appropriate. That's not correct. And so if we are ready to go to heaven, then our values should change. Our Lives should change. The way that we live should change. We must live truly as the uh, citizens of heaven, appropriately. We must live appropriately. And that is what this is saying here. And so, those that are saved must live appropriately. Appropriately and, and, and worthy of the calling that he has called us with. We must live worthy of, of that calling of going to heaven. Being ex living acceptably. We must live um, appropriately as his children, right? So that's my first Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. Let's take a look. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you, right? He called us um, and we received salvation. Who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. He has saved us, and the purpose why he has saved us is so that we can walk worthy of God, um, who calls us into his own kingdom and glory. What type of place is heaven? It is a very beautiful place. Heaven is where God's glory is filled. Yes, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God, he has created us in his image, and the reason why he did so is so that we can receive the love life and to become his children 
so that he could bring us to heaven and so that we can live with him eternally. That was his purpose of creating us in his image. But we sinned and we all have lost these things. That's why it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have no right to enter into that glory of God because we have sinned. The reason why he has saved us is to give us that glory once again. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, it says, In bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The only begotten son, he died, and then many sons were born after him, and many people can go to heaven. Right? That work, that work is the work of salvation. This work of salvation has allowed us now to go into the glory of God. And that is why um, it says to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. God's only begotten son had to die on the cross. And the reason why he had to go through that suffering is so for it is for us to enter into his glory. Is this something that we can fathom and completely comprehend? This is not something that we can easily think of. So it says that you walk, would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So that we can walk worthy of the God who allows us to go into his own kingdom and glory. We can't live like the people of this world, following the fleshly lust. We can't go after the things that we see with our eyes, the materialistic things, the fleshly things. We can't live any way that we want to. That is not living a life that is worthy of God. In order to, um, in order for us to enter into His glory, um, we must walk worthy of this this, this calling. Right? And every single day we need to learn more and more about it. And we need to not only learn it, but we need to apply it in our lives. Because that day is coming closer. It's coming closer. Right? If you have a if you have a little larva um, you know, going into um, becoming a cicada takes seven years in Korea. But then for, um, for in America, cicadas, they're born every 17 years, right? And, and like that, we are just these, these larvas in this world, and we're just in this world living the way that we want to. We go through maybe sufferings, tribulations, and persecution, but soon enough, we will get out of our, our shell right? and enter into great glory. We'll be changed into a glorious being. And we will enter into heaven. And that is the day that we yearn for, that we desire, hope for. Right? It says once again that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. As born again Christians, we shouldn't be envious of the people of this world. Do you, do you say like, oh, I wish I could be like that? Do they look cool and um, amazing to you? And do saved Christians, saved Christians, you know, they should be looking at the brothers and sisters that are older in their faith life. But if they look at each other, uh, at, at brothers and sisters that are, that are on the same level as them, if you will, and say, oh, I'm living a pretty good Christian life in, in relation, re relatively to, relative to this person. We have to understand that our standard is not man, but it is God. It is the Lord. We must look at the Lord, right? And we must desire to become like Him. Jesus Christ, He likewise entered into glory after going through sufferings. So that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. God, He desires something from us, right? I mean, He desires this from us. What will we do? Are we going to live any way that we want to? Is that okay? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 2. It 
with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And so must we, we must walk worthy of this calling, then what is it that we have to do? There's another purpose why he has called us, and it is. Um, you know that he, God, he has gathered his people together, and he said that he would die, right? In John, um, in, in John it says this, and we were like sheep who have, were, have gone astray, Isaiah. Yes, and we went any way that we wanted. We turned everyone to our own way, uh, according to our own thoughts, opinions, stubbornness. But after receiving salvation, we are not those sheep that have lost his shepherd, right? Who have gone astray. But now we are sheep who have returned to the overseer or the shepherd, right? And, and you know, um, it says that we will be one flock and one shepherd, right? one flock and one shepherd, and he will guide us to the eternal place. He is a good shepherd. And that good shepherd, he takes care of us, he protects us, he leads us, and we are in this flock that the shepherd is taking care of. We have become one. We have become one. And we talked about this last time as well, but to become one, um, this is something we want to really focus on, but the Lord before he was crucified on the cross, he says, just as I am, I am one with my father, we, he, he wanted to become one with them as well, his disciples. And he prayed this type of prayer multiple times. And so we say people are one and one flock now. We are, uh, we are under one God, right? We are one um, citizen, um, one, one people under, uh, we are citizens of one country. And so we are one. So yes, we must call, be, walk worthy of that calling. And this means to be one in the church. The Lord, he, he is the head. And because the head is one, the body likewise is one. And what must we do to become one? There's a purpose of becoming one, right? That's the other reason. That's another reason. It says, with all lowliness and gentleness. So what is it that we must do? In order to become one, we must have gentleness and lowliness. Before we seeing salvation, we were very prideful. We lived according to our own stubbornness, our own ways, our, whatever we wanted to do, no matter what happened to other people. Right? That is arrogance or pride. Satan, he was very prideful and he got kicked out of heaven. And he's the one who is bringing, dragging people to hell. He is the um, epitome of pride and arrogance. And people sin because of their pride, right? They want to step over other people and, and be successful themselves. But humility and lowliness is really deeming other people, considering other people higher than themselves, right? And really glorifying, exalting them. Matthew chapter twenty, um, chapter eleven says, "Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart." Yes, the Lord, He was very, very gentle, and He was very um, He silently obeyed God, right? no matter if people reviled Him or hated Him or did whatever to Him, whether they struck Him or did any of these things, He was silent. Right. He didn't say, I have no sins. Why are you trying to kill me? No, he didn't say this. He didn't say this is so unfair. Nope, he didn't say that either. Right. It says when he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but commit himself to him who judges righteously. Yes, until death, he was very silent, quiet. Right. That's what it means to be gentle. Right. Or we can say being kind or being very soft. Right. Um, but the gentleness that Jesus talking is talking is talking about is being silent and being obey, obedient to God's will, regardless of the situation that is given to us. And even in the church, there are some people that are very opinionated and they judge other people. And people try to you know bring people down. They have conflicts. They hate people. They're envious of others. This is the exact opposite of being gentle, of being lowly.
people are become more fierce and more brutal. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it talks about certain characteristics, um, traits of people at the end times. It says they'll be disobedient parents. They'll be unthankful. They'll be brutal. They're very, very brutal, people are. They're traitors. We, we, are, we betray our friends. For our own benefit, we do these things, right? And so there are people that are so fierce, so brutal. If you just touch them, you know, soft and quiet people, gentle people, they are, um, um, you know, even, even gentle people that seem um, gentle on the outside, when you touch them and kind of handle them the wrong way, then they are very fierce. They have a fierce reaction, right? Uh, and it's like it's like cats at home, right? Some cats may seem very calm, but then you just poke them the wrong way and they get very brutal, they get very scary. They have this type of nature inside of them, this temperament. Some people, they may seem very gentle um, normally, but yeah. You, you poke them a little bit, maybe you, you just, um, if you just, you know, touch them the wrong way, you grind, they, just, um, they, they show their brutal or their fierce side of them. And, and you realize that not, that, you know, people have this, everyone has this. And so I was going down to um, Busan in Korea. Um, and there's, uh, it was on a train that uh, doesn't run anymore, but, um, and in, in the seat right next to me, there was this um, this woman, and she was the wife of this one man, and she was wearing the, the Korean traditional wear. Um, and she was wearing white shoes. Um, and she was just dressed very beautifully, and she was very dressed very calmly and very gently. Um, but there was this one um, this one man who was a, a businessman. He was selling some stuff in the train, and he stepped on her shoes. And she's like, are you crazy out of mind? You're out of mind? Out of your mind? And you know, I was so shocked to see this, hear this woman, um, you know, shot like this because she was very calm, right? She just completely flipped. And she just, you know, swore all the swears that she could think of, every, every single curse word that she can think of. It was very scary. All of a sudden, it was a sudden change. And so when you, you know, handle people the wrong way, if you treat people the wrong way, this type of stuff come out. Gentle people, you know, someone will say, like, oh, I'm sorry. And the person who's gentle will say, oh, that's okay. No worries. And I could just, you know, just wash it off or I could just kind of, you know, um, you know, get rid of the dust or whatever, dirt. But, you know, many people are very, very fierce and brutal. And everything just comes out of them when they're treated the wrong way. Right? They're brutal. Should I, you know, try this on everyone here you know, to see, um, you know, how everyone reacts? So we need to be lowly and we need to be gentle. These are pairs. Right? A person who is lowly is gentle and a person who is gentle is lowly. Another word for loneliness is humility. Um, but anyways, they are very, very, um, very, very um, low. They're very, very humble. Right? It's not exalting themselves over other people, but rather it's really lowering themselves over, um, under people. It talks a lot about, the Bible talks a lot about the humility and the lowliness, the gentleness of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 13, verse 13 to 15, if you look there, it says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. And let's think about this. You know who washes feet? The, the people that washed feet back in the day are the servants, right? They washed the um, feet of their masters. And in Palestine, there were a lot. There was a lot of dust, right? And we didn't. They didn't wear shoes like we do now, but they wear. They wore sandals, right? Um, they were wearing sandals back in the day. And so every, the, the whole day you'll be outside, and there'll be so much dust, um, and be mixed with your sweat and you know dirt and stuff like this, and it would smell a lot. Of course, your feet would. And the servant would wash the feet of the master. And Jesus Christ is what he did. He knelt and he washed the feet of his disciples. Can you imagine this? Yes, you call me teacher and Lord. It's not just a teacher and Lord. He is the creator of the universe. He is the king of kings. He is equal with God. He, this man, he became a, a human being and he became so low, um, a, a low as a servant, right? And he washed the dirty feet of his um, disciples. And he says, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Right? 
Ah, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet, right? And he wants them to copy what example? The example of humility. You also wash each other's feet. You know, we wash each other's feet because they're dirty. If you have clean feet, there's no need for other people to clean your feet. To wash your feet, right? And if some people have certain weaknesses, people are like, oh, you're, why are you like this? And you, why are you like that? And, you know, you, you judge people if, if, even though you're a lot worse off than they are. Love, you see, it covers a multitude of sins. It covers a multitude of sins. That is what washing each other's feet truly is. A mother will look at her children, and even if her children are very immature, she would say, oh, I was like that when I was their age too. Other people might look at her children and say, man, you call that a child? You call that a person? You know? You know I can't believe you, you call that a, a, a person. Right. But the mother will look at her children and, you know, talk in response to that person, you know, that, that my child is a very precious child of mine, right? That's my very precious um, daughter or son. Even though he or she is like that right now, he or she will grow up and when he gets older, he will become more mature, right? He'll become more mature. And so the parents wait, right? Love, I mean, bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things and endures all things. Yes, we are hoping for the best. But just because people don't, you don't get along with people, why is it that you cause divisions? Is it possible to become one with that type of mindset? If there's a family that has a lot of children, there'll be children that listen well, people that are not so, um, that, that do not listen well. There are um, many um, good children, bad children, but the mother, she embraces all of them, hugs all of them, right? If we want to become one, yes, we must with all loneliness and gentleness live our faith lives. With long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Why is that we need to be Patient. It says love is, is patient, right? The reason why um, he tells us to be patient is because there are going to be instances when we, uh, we are, it, it tests our patience, right? If you are tested at your patience um, and you say, look, well, I can't be patient any longer, then what will you do then, right? The Lord, he knew that Judas would, would sell him, but he still loved him till the end. He washed the feet of Judas and he gave the bread to Judas. This was a, an expression of his love. But, and he continued to love Jesus Christ, uh, rather Judas until the end. But Judas, he rejected Jesus Christ until the end. Regardless of whether he betrayed Jesus Christ, Jesus still loved Judas. And that is the heart, the mind of Christ. With long suffering, bearing with one another in love. If the Lord, he was hasty, if he was impatient like us, then we would all be cast away from him. Right? The Lord, he um, was very, he was full of long suffering. He was very, very patient. And in the midst of all this love, he was able to bear with us. And that's why Apostle Paul said this as well. Bear with one another just as Jesus, the Lord, he has bear, he has um, was patient with us. We must have this type of open heart of like Jesus Christ did and, and accept one another, bear of one another, bear with one another. When the Lord, he accepted us and receives us, it's not because we have no problems. It's not because we are perfect. No, he unconditionally loved us, right? He loved us. Um, without any conditions, and he just he embraced us. And in the midst, uh, um, it's, it says here, I'm um, bearing with one another in love. And there's some people who you know you know have conflicts because of small issues, and you know it. it you really begin to think, you know, when did all these people mature, right? Because they fight over these small issues. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this is a bond of love, right? And there's that one song that, that goes like that. The unity of the Spirit. God, His grace and the Lord's humility. And with love, 
we become one. We are able to become one with these things. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. To become one, what do you think? Um, when we look at the born-again Christians, our brothers and sisters, are you able to bear with one, uh, bear with one another in love? Or do you ch choose and um, you just choose people? Oh, that person, because of this, I'm not going to accept him. Because of that, I'm not going to accept him. Um, maybe this person I like, so I'll get a little closer to him or her. Do you just select, pick, and choose who you want to be close to? That is purely a fleshly thing, a humanistic thing. And that it could become, you could have that type of humanistic love towards people. But you need to open up your heart. Regardless of whether they are good or bad, whether they're educated or not, whether they are um, have good character or bad character, even though even though they have flaws, we need to love each other because we are all saved. If we are going to be living with each other eternally in heaven, because of those reasons alone, we must forgive one another. We must bear with one another. We must endure. We must be patient with one another. And only then will the Holy Spirit will we be able to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? If the Lord, He accepts us, why is it that we cannot accept each other? Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 2 and 3. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So why is it that Apostle Paul, he wrote these words to the Church of Philippi? The Church of Philippi um, had many brothers and sisters that tried very hard. Right? It was a very exemplary church. Um, they were united in preaching the gospel with Apostle Paul. And when Apostle Paul, he was uh, imprisoned in Rome, he, they supported him with the things that he needed. And if you look at Philippians chapter 4, it says, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel. And um, Philippi, the, the, the church of Philippi, it started with Lydia in um, Acts chapter 16, verse 14. You see there, um, you know, she opened up her house and she said, if you see me see, uh, as, a, as a person of God, then please come into my house. Judge me to be faithful to the Lord. Come to my house and stay. And so that's why Paul, Silas, Luke, they went into her house and stayed with her. And they stayed um, at the house of Lydia and they preached the gospel. And so the church of Philippi started in Lydia's house. But it wasn't only Lydia that was very supportive. There were a lot of sisters as well. Um, in our age, there, there are a lot of um, our churches that are established because um, our sisters um, you know, were, were there. Yes, woman, she committed sin first, but she is also the one that will receive salvation first. Actually, there are a lot of instances like that at least. Even at the time of Jesus Christ, they're the, um, the women were the people that really supported the Lord. They followed the disciples and Jesus Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't, there weren't many men. There were many women even that went to the point of the, of the cross, right? Um, it, it was the woman that went to the tomb of Jesus Christ, even though the disciples, they all were scattered. These are the people, the, the women are the ones that were in front in, when it came to preaching the gospel. Of course, they preached the gospel very diligently. But they're, they're so opinionated as well, sisters are, many times. And so that's why the church of Philippi, the sisters, had contentions with one another. Yes, they were very diligent in preaching the gospel. But they, they were you know, divided in terms of what, what to do. Um, and and they, wanted to, they, they wanted their voice to be heard. And that's what the issue was with this church. 
you, or you try your, you want to, um, you know, voice your opinion. You want people to hear your opinions and you want it to be the best, right? And if people are not like you, then there will be disputes and conflicts. And so that is why Apostle Paul here, that is exactly the exact reason why he said, it says, being like-minded, right? Please be like-minded and also have the same love. You have received the love of God, but the love that we have received from God is not a humanistic love. Because a humanistic love is if someone loves you, you love them in return. If they hate you, you hate them in return. Right? It is so conditional, that love, that humanistic love. But the love of the Lord is an agape love. Right? There is no condition. It is an unconditional love. It is a perfect love. It is an eternal love. It is a love that has no deceit or lies in it. That love Right? We must have the same love, which is the love of the Lord. Having the same love, being of one accord. What does that mean? So what, what They think about exactly what it is that God wants us to do. And if we all think that way, there will be no problems. Right? Being of one accord, of one mind. Right? Of one mind. What mind is that? It is the mind of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In verse 5, that's what it says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that's what Apostle Paul was saying here. He's saying, have this mind in you, right? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Because where there is this type of conceit or selfish ambition, you know, there is, um, you know, uh, there are people that try to boast or brag about themselves and, and um, try to get on the top. So it says here to let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But it continues on in verse 3 and says, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Only then will we become one. So becoming one, this is so very important. Colossians chapter 2 verse 20. It says, Therefore, if you die with Christ from the basic prince of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to regulations? And so yes, we have been, um, we have peace with God um, vertically and horizontally we have peace with brothers and sisters. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. God, through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, we have a lot, this, this death has a lot of speak reconciled with God. We have peace with him, reconciliation, right? We have this with him. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. This is very important here, right? Not only has allowed us to become reconciled with him, but he has also given us the ministry of reconciliation as well. He has given us this ministry. We preach the gospel. And sinners, through the blood of, of the cross, right, we can be reconciled, right? That's how sinners are reconciled with, Jesus, with, with God. And so that's why we must have this ministry. We must preach the gospel. Right? We who are enemies of God have now become reconciled to him. Through Jesus Christ on the cross, all of our sins are washed away. And he brings out his hand. He, he, he um, gives our hand, his hand to us, right? And says, let's be reconciled. And when you receive salvation, that is when you hold out your hand too. You, you grab his hand and accept it. And not only that, but we must also be reconciled with one another as born-again Christians. And that is the work that God has entrusted. He has given to us. That's why in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Matthew chapter 5 talks about the, the Beatitudes or the eight blessings. If you look carefully, it, it talks about seven blessings, but um, there's one that gets repeated. Regardless, the last thing that it says in the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You'll be sealed as the son of God. Why? 
because uh, making peace is so very important. Making peace or having people be reconciled with God is allowing people to you know, have peace with God, naturally. Um, that is the ministry or the work that God has entrusted to us. And so the way that born-again Christians can be reconciled right, with, with, God, um, with um, God is when we do these things. And we need to think about this very um, seriously, right? As, as born-again Christians, right, if we could not have self, um, fellowship with other born-again Christians, we're just loners, right? You just think your own thoughts. And if people don't match you or, or, or don't get along with you, then you just you cut them off. Is there someone that's? Is there someone in the world that's going to really be um 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 very that that's going to get along with you one hundred percent? No, right? Of course not. And so it is through the grace of God, through His love, that He accepted us, and just like that, we need to accept, right? That is what reconciliation is, and that is what fellowship is, right? You don't just you know have fellowship with the people that you get along with. No, that's not true fellowship. Just because we are saved, that is reason enough to have fellowship, right, with other brothers and sisters. And that is proof if we're able to have fellowship with brothers and sisters that we do not get along with. That is proof that we are the children of God. First John chapter three it says, "We know that we have path, passed from death to life because we love the brethren." We have passed from death to life. And the evidence of that, what is it? It is that we have loved the brethren, the brothers and sisters. But a born-again Christian, you can't have fellowship with that born-again Christian. Why? Because that person doesn't want to open his heart or her heart with other people, to other people. Because there's no one who gets along with him or her. Right? But there's no one like that in the world that gets along with you 100%. If you have that heart, do you think God, he will accept you? Why is it that, you know, the heart of saved Christians are so small? Blessed are the peacemakers, right? And that is how you can, the people that are um, peacemakers gather together at church, right? And it is through that, that the Holy Spirit makes that gathering um, united. And that is a gathering of, um, of, of the church, of the born Christians. It says, for they shall be called sons of God. That is the proof, the seal of um, the evidence that the people are the sons of God. That's not how you become the son of God, but that is the evidence that you are the son of God. So it says, to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. To endeavor. To endeavor. This is a very important. Um, this is a very important. In the Garden of Eden, God talked to Adam. He spoke to him and said, "He says to keep the um the, the Garden of Eden, right? To tend it. Why did He say to protect it? Because there's there is something that's going to attack, right? To keep your health. What does that mean? Um, people say to keep your health because there are bacteria that we cannot see that are continually attacking us, right? And continually invading our bodies, like the coronavirus. Why is it that we have masks on? To protect ourselves from the virus or from the bacteria. We must keep and um, protect our health. We must keep and protect our family, right? Because if you don't, then your family is going to be um, it's going to be separated. Same with the nation, right? Our nation needs to be protected because if it's not protected, your enemies will invade, right? That is why the citizens, the people of a nation, must be united. If they're not, then the enemies will come and attack, and it will destroy the nation. If you want to protect your country, you need to become strong by becoming united, and that is how you can protect your nation. Why does Satan endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit? It is because, yes, Satan, he cannot take our salvation, but he can destroy our faith lives, and he can destroy the work of God. How? He scatters Christians abroad, right? He scatters Christians. And if he does this successfully, 
then the Christian life will not be able to live properly. We'll be able will not be able to follow the work and the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit. We cannot preach the gospel. And Satan, he knows this very clearly, and that is why he is trying to separate Christians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Yes, peace was fulfilled between us and God first, and then the peace must be fulfilled between us and the church, and he has called us in one body. In order to become one body, he has, he has called us so that we can be one body. Right? Why are these verses repeated over and over again? It says, and be thankful in the end, right? It says not to, dis not to complain and have disputes. Be thankful. Saved Christians must always be thankful regardless of the situation that is given to them. Yes, even if we have such a lackings amongst the brothers and sisters, just because we are saved, right? That is the reason enough that we should be able to stay in the church and be thankful for that. Do you say, hey, I don't want to see you again, so get out of here. Right? Is that the right response? Just because you don't want to see someone, you just kick them out? Is that the right thing to do? That brother or sister, because he or she is in the church, I am thankful. We are thankful, and it makes me so happy. Yes. When many people have fellowship in the church, we are thankful, and we glorify God. Right? You were called in one body, right? And be thankful. That's what must we must do. We must be thankful and not complain. We have been called in one body. It is not because we are perfect that we are united, no. Yes, we are saved, but we still have so many problems. Regardless, we are one. And we are baptized in the one spirit and we become one. And when we are in that body, we become more and more perfect. No, it's not because we are perfect that we become one, no. Before marriage, these two people, the man and woman, they meet, right? One man, one woman meet together for marriage to love one another, to live with one another. But there are many problems that each of them brings. Some um, fight a lot, right? I don't know what the issue is, but when you, you know, these, these people get into their marriages and they fight a lot, right? And they say, oh, you know, if, if I knew that this was going to happen, then I wouldn't have gotten married. You know, some people say. But as you live more and more, you're able to learn more about one another, your pers differences in personalities, and you're able to bear with one another, and you're able to, you know, really be considerate and um, really understand each other. You try to help each other out. And so that is how you become more and more one, right? Are we all, all, all similar because we all receive salvation? No, there's so many differences that each and every one of us have. Then what are we supposed to do? Do we have to continually point those things out? Do we have to always say that's a big problem because of those small things? No, we must be patient with one another. We must um, you know, give in. We must understand each other. We must try our best to help each other out. And in the midst of all of these things, slowly but surely, we will become more and more like Christ and we will become united. That is what a church is. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, um, there's not much time left, so I'm just kind of um, reciting these out of memory, from memory. It says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. It says, for where two or three are gathered. You know, I read this passage, and... You know, I just kind of just read it and passed by. But then one time I was reading and I, was, I found something very really shocking. It says, for where two or three are, are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. What does this mean? Two, two or three people that are saved, right? Not only are they saved, but these two or three people are people that kneel in front of God, right? Who bow down in front of Him. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. What does it mean to bow down? If you just say, oh yeah, we've, been, we've gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. Does Jesus Christ always, is he with them? Always? No. People that have been saved through the name of Jesus Christ and those people that are kneeling, um, they're bowing in front of Jesus Christ. Those people that have submitted their lives in front of God, those two, two or three people, right? 
those two or three people, God is with them, right? The church is consists of two or three um, or more people, right? And the Lord, he being with them, what does that mean? He being in the midst of them, what does this mean? Of course, yes, if I'm by myself, yes, he is with me. But where two or more people are gathered together, kneeling in front of the Lord, God, yes, he will work through them. Yes, he will work through us and, and, and really um, work through us mightily. So uh, let's let's go to Ephesians uh, to read this passage. Let's go to Ephesians chapter three, verse twenty. Ephesians chapter three, verse twenty. Because of the coronavirus, um, I'll just read by myself. Please read it in um, in your heads. Um, it says, Now to him was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Now to him was able to do exceedingly abundantly. Right? It says in us in the end, right? In us. We who are saved, we who submit our lives in front of God, two or three or more, ten, hundred, uh, the more the better. But just because there are a lot of people doesn't mean God is going to work through those people. It is those people that really submit their lives in front of God. Those people that really want to do the will of God and throw their own will away. Right? Those people that really make God the head, the Lord, the Lord the head, and not, not, their, not themselves. Those people, when those people gather together, He will work through us, right? Because this is the body of Christ. And in this body, the, the, the body does the will of the head. And He has strength to do so, right? The... Um, now to him was able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. The power that works in us. Yes, we preach the gospel and the work of salvation is being done. It is because the, work, it is because the power of God is being manifested, is being revealed through us. That's why in Acts chapter 2 verse 47, if you look there, um, there were 3,000 people that received salvation during the Pentecost, and they received the teachings of the disciples. They broke bread together, and they praised the name of the Lord together. They had fellowship, and when they did so, it said, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That is where God, He works. If our hearts are divided, and we hate each other, and we um, break each other down, those people, God, He is not going to be in the midst of them. We must be united in order for God to work through us. The sun cannot burn something in this world, right? But if you get like a blue lens, this is not a blue lens, but um, but if you get like a magnifying glass, for example, and you, you concentrate the sun, then yes, you can um, ignite something, right? I cannot do it, but we can. And... When we are together in heart, that is when the Holy Spirit works. United we stand, divided we fall. Yes. When we unite, we will be able to stand together. And many people can receive salvation, but we, when we're divided, yes, we will destroy or ruin our faith lives and the work of people receiving salvation, that there is no work of people receiving salvation. And so that is why we must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. The Lord, uh, rather, Satan, he tries to ruin this, right? And that is what he's doing. That is why we must endeavor to do this. Adam was not able to do so, and that is why the Garden of Eden was destroyed. It was, it's gone. It disappeared. And there was a problem that Adam had with God. Sin entered into the world. And this work, this, this painful work, history, started because he couldn't keep the Garden of Eden. And that's why we now must keep the church. We must understand that it is because of me and my disunity with the church that I can destroy the work of the church. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, it says. And this is applicable to all saints, right? This is a command that the Lord He Himself has given to each and every one of us. We must keep it. We must endeavor to keep it, right? Continually, we must try. Yes, 
Yes. We cannot, with our wrongdoings and sins, make the work of um, the Holy Spirit um, not happen. Our selfish actions, jealousy, um, wrath, envy, and, and because of our humanistic feelings and, and the, the, the um, contentions we have, laziness, and all these other sins, right? the, the false doctrines, all of these things um, prohibit us from becoming united um, and, and will therefore not allow the Spirit to work through the church. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It is a command, okay? And that is what we have to do in the church. It is for me. It is for the brothers and sisters. And it is for the lost souls that are not yet saved, right? This is what we must do. Your opinions, your thoughts, your stubbornness, your emotions. Don't reveal those things. Because if you do, then you're a person that is full of pride and contention, disputes, and there is no end to those things. That is wrong. We must do our best to not break the unity of the Spirit. Because if we make a mistake, then yes, we might be the people that um, 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 break this unity. Um, I'll stop here because I think if I talk too much, then you'll forget it all. So we'll continue next week. Let's pray. Merciful Heavenly Father. these end times that you have um, um, made, Lord, you have called us and you have allowed us to become part of the church through your abundant lot, um, grace, life, and love, Lord, you have allowed us to dwell. Uh, we thank you for um, giving us the grace of allowing us to be obedient to your commands. Lord, we know that you are with us and we ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit can help us become more united and we thank you for the grace that you have allowed us to do your work. Lord, allow us to walk worthy of the calling that you have called us with and allow us to, with a lowly heart, a gentle heart, serve you. And with a heart of um, long suffering, allow us to bear with one another in love. And with the power that you give to us, Lord, allow us to do your good will, your holy will. We ask that you can guide us in this manner. We know that you are our Father, and we have the same faith as brothers and sisters. And for the remainder of our lives, Lord, we ask that you can rule over our lives. We ask that you can protect us and keep us um, so, that, um, um, so that Satan does not work through us so, and, uh, he, and so that he does not break the peace um, with us, um, within us, Lord. Um, we ask that you guide us through our entire lives, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.